Have a lovely. <laughs> and thank you, gentlemen, as well. That was smashing. And interestingly, mm. you made your first uh, performance in opera, didn't you? Yeah, that's a long time ago. But that was the first time that I ever sang on a stage. What was that? Professionally for money, anyway. It was a La Boheme by Puccini. And the reason it came about was because my school, based in Sussex, one of the uh, ladies on the Board of Governors was Mrs Christie. So whilst they would normally only audition prep schools, we got the chance to go through the audition rounds as well. And I was lucky enough to get on there. And what part did you play? Just a little street vendor running around in the second act. Oh. I don't know if you're familiar with the opera, but there's a toy seller yes. called Pabignol. Oh, yes. uh yeah, it's all for buffs, everybody, I suppose. Oh, my cuff there. <laughs> but I just used to, I, I just had to run around the stage pretending to sell sweets or whatever. And you got paid? Yes, How three much? pounds a night. As many sweets one night. as you could eat? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was funny because we were just, we used to speak in a normal kind of Sussex way and the other people in the chorus, the other children in the chorus were from very well-to-do prep schools. And I remember their headmaster saying, offering the comprehensive people, would you like a Mars bar? And we just used to always think, Mars bar, ooh, great. But, and the way he used to pronounce it was very strange. Mars but, bar. So we had many Mars bars and many Coca-Colas and three pounds a night. Sounds good. It was what? good for a 13-year-old. Brilliant. What was your first appearance, Michael? Um, my first appearance on the stage was uh, um, the end of the pier at Cromer when I was about five years old and I'd gone along to see a magician. It was a matinee performance and uh, there weren't many people there really, it was mainly me and my mother. So <laughs> when, when you asked for volunteers, I just got there ahead of my mother. And, uh, sort of, we had a glamorous assistant who, who uh, was handing out sort of rings and then he would be blindfolded and he'd put all the rings together and then he'd loosen them all. So I was given the job of being the assistant and he was blindfolded and so I, had to, do I all had to hand him the rings. But I, I did a bit of like I'd seen the assistant doing it, a bit of fiddling around before, <laughs> before giving it to him. After about the third one, he leaned across to me and said, for God's sake, stop mucking about. <laughs> and, uh, that was the end, almost, my, almost the end of my career. Mm -hmm. Deeply, deeply disillusioned. I was talking to Michael earlier about ancestors, of course, but you know nothing about yours, do you? Nothing. I mean, I know the Jameses, Mr. and Mrs. James, who are my adoptive parents. But now I've never met my real ones. And I've come to the stage now in my life where I really don't have an interest in meeting them. And there was a time, probably around the age of 21, where, you know, you always go through a time when you feel as though you need to understand where you come from and identify yourself with. And uh, I went through that stage where I thought it might be good for me to know, to know what my mother looked like or whatever, or what their personalities were like. But, and I worked towards this, and then on the crunch, then when it really became almost a reality of where people around me were saying, right, if you want to do it, you can, because we have the resources to be able to bring you together now. And I just, I remember, we were on tour, and I remember lying in the hotel thinking, do I really want to come face to face with my makers, if you like, after 25 years or 24 years of just being Wendy, who's come from I don't know where, I like to feel, and I, I kind of started thinking though I created myself because you can't uh, put any of yourself onto, other, onto your parents and I was just an individual by that and I just decided then no, I'd really rather, rather not meet them. And also from meeting my friends, just from talking to my friends who nine out of ten of them grew up with their natural parents and still a lot of them going into 30, mid 30s, a lot of them are still so under the mm. guilt trip that parents lay on you. And that's their natural parents that I thought, maybe I don't need this in my life anymore. <clears throat> well, you've rationalised it pretty well. Yes, yeah, sometimes I wonder whether I've rationalised it almost too much so mm. that there is no emotion. But you know something about the nationality, don't you? Well, my mother was Norwegian. She was over here learning English and she got knocked up. And she had to, <laughs> she had to delay her homecoming for an extra nine months. And she gave birth to me. I don't even know the name of my father. But so I presume she's somewhere in Norway with a legitimate family of her own, and I don't know about him. You could go with Michael and discover your homeland as well, if you want to. Well, let's to. do that. <laughs> That's a jolly good idea. I tell you, fix us up if you go on the program. It's like LWT computer dating. <laughs> <laughs> you have been around. I mean, you've been to Eastern Europe. And are, are they as really taken with rock and roll now? 
Well, so much is so much has been happening over there lately that it's all they're actually far more enthusiastic about all the mod cons than people in Western Europe, maybe. The uh, most notable thing about going to Poland, which is when we, when I did go there, it was the 10th anniversary of the first solidarity meeting, mm. and it was so funny because during the day my bass player and I would just got in a little old taxi and, and driven around Gdansk and we'd stopped outside Lech Walesa's house with our cameras like real American tourists and were clicking away so we could come home and say, oh, we saw where he lives. And then later on in that evening when we were doing this festival, he turned up and I met him and I met his wife and it only really hit me on the airplane on the way home that you, know, you can meet a dozen pop stars and, you know, other famous pop stars and it's just like, they're just like me. But to actually meet somebody that has changed the course of world history, it really is quite a bonus. You didn't just meet him, you actually sort of got on down with him, didn't you? Got on down, well, he had a groove at our gig, definitely. And mm. I mean, I, I'd, I'd had a little bit to drink that evening. So in between the songs, I was doing a bit of a world peace kind of stance. And I'm sure none of the Polish people understood what I was actually saying. But I kept going, do you understand? And Lech was at the front going, yeah. And so, I mean, it was all very <laughs> rock and roll and things, but it was wonderful, yeah. Mm. But I t and, and another thing I'd like to say, and that is that after having been on world tours, and you probably found this as well, that the countries that haven't had a tremendous amount of pressure, oppression and that haven't fought wars on their own soil, they're so cynical and bitter and spoilt almost, they take everything for granted. Whereas you go to a country like Poland, and through the media we here would presume, oh, it's a really depressing country, they're all lining up in food queues. And they are the, some of the most generous kind, they'd give you their last everything, they'd take you in. And because they've been shunted about through politics and oppressed awfully through so many years, and they've had to knuckle under, you know, and really survive, mm. The way they behave is so generous and loving. Uh, countries that haven't gone through this, they're so, ah, oh, gee, we can have everything we want. And it's, it's a really interesting... Well, I, mean, I, I really agree, because I found on, on going around the world that the people who had least gave you most and were the most yeah. generous, unstintingly generous. I mean, the people we went on the Dow with, I mean, they, they had nothing. They paid £30 for a journey there and back, which was sort of three weeks. Yeah. And they shared absolutely everything with us. Um, so that's, that's the way it is, yeah. It is the way it is. Let me ask you about the group. Now, <clears throat> nothing surprises these days, but is there a story behind the choice of Transvision Vamp? Mm, well, to many journalists I've analysed the name, but the truth is Nick and I, Nick the guitarist, the songwriter, he and I just had to come up with a name. It's very difficult actually finding an original name that doesn't, doesn't sound stupid, but then you think about Sting, and if a bloke walked up to you in the street and said, oh, from now on I'm going to call myself Sting, you'd say, what a stupid name. But actually, once you have an image around yourself and you've proved your work worthwhile, mm. any name can take on its own credibility. Mm. So, we take, so we just chose trans all across the world, vision, we're aware of what's going on, vamp, let's put some vamping and, you know, vamp things up slightly. But Michael, um, talking about bands and interesting names, you can come up with an equally interesting one, can't you? Your son's band. Well, my son, my son had a band. It's sort of around at the moment. You know, they're waiting for the big break. I mean, they're in the garage, in the car, with the engine running. Um, and their band's called Bob Gone Crazy, which is... Uh, is that a reference to Dylan? I don't Bob? think so, no. no. It's, it's too literal. You got me there. Because <laughs> <laughs> transvision vamp means something. You know, I'm trying to not psychoanalyze this. No, I'm not sure. No, I don't think it is. I don't think my son is a great Dylan How fan. How old is he? It's just Bob. Probably Bob down the chemist, it is. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> he has unfortunately gone crazy, but he, oh, didn't, uh, he is uh, at the chemist, so he's plenty to take for it. So your he's, son's, what, 43 now? And he's, my son's, uh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, he was older than me. Quite extraordinary. We're in the Guinness Book of Records. No, he's, he's 22 and, uh, and he's aspiring. But are you encouraging him? Hmm? Yeah, are you encouraging him? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, one thing I always regretted I, I could never do was play an instrument, and I love music and listening to music. So, and he has got a talent. It's just taking a while to which get the break. Which instrument does he play? Well, he learnt the saxophone, um, and now he, now he plays keyboards, which seems to be the instrument you know, which you can compose on. He's writing music as well. Um, so, yes, I mean, I'm prepared to wait, but it's a, it's a hard slog. But really? I say, well, at 22, mm. I wasn't doing anything very much. Of course you were. Do, they get, in, do they get in the oh. transit van and go <clears throat> off gigging and stuff? Yeah, well, they get in the transit van, and then they have to get out again and put the wheels back. <laughs> <laughs> They've got 
three wheels. They're looking for the four. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, no, they, uh, they haven't played a lot of gigs. Um, uh, but he does a bit of DJing and all that. And, oh. uh, you know, plays, he, he plays the music and does the scratching and the wobbling and the... You know. All that newfangled stuff. Ah, uh, that's great. Yes. Yeah. yes. <laughs> Well, now, to, uh, to call somebody many-faced might sound insulting, but in the case of my next guest, I think it is within the Trades Descriptions Act. Indeed, in her recent television series, About Face, she played a variety of loopy people. She's created a memorable character as British Telecom's Beatty, and she's about to assume the appearance of Joyce Grenfell in another revival of her highly successful show. Ladies and gentlemen, Maureen Lipman. <laughs> bit of exercise you can't beat it. <laughs> it occurred to me that the Lipman is an anagram of M. Palin. Yes. Oh, at last. They found we are about, the same person. We are we in are fact home. the same person. Well. I'm starting at the South Pole and I'm going by Pogo. <laughs> <laughs> And you'll meet in the lavatory somewhere in Loda. <laughs> this also is, I have to say, a palindromic year. 1991 reads the same backwards as forwards. There's only going to be three of those. This Palin palindromic. Decade. Sorry, I just this carry is, on. This is better, actually, than the scatological stuff from before, isn't it, Lee? Oh, yes. You know, that mm. was disgusting. We'll ah, keep I it was... in, of course. No, yes, you're in my seat. <laughs> 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 Fine. Sorry, no, no, really. Too late now. Oh, anyway, yes. you and Michael met a long time ago, I believe. Yes, we did. We, uh, I suppose it was about 1966. I was a drama student, and he was very old. And um, <laughs> actually, um, a, a girl who was in my drama school, Annabelle Leventon, was due to be in a review with uh, Michael at um, Edinburgh, I think it was. We can't remember very well. We've been talking about it back in the hostility room. And um, <laughs> anyway, she couldn't go, so I went. And um, I was in this review with, with, with Michael. But I, I actually can't remember much about it, except I, one sketch where I had to come on stage and take all my clothes off. Now, as you well know, Michael, people pay me vast fortunes not to take my clothes off. <laughs> um, and uh, so it was all mimed, so they sung off stage, da 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 dee, and I came on like a real slag and began by, <laughs> I took off the, you know, the first lot and then the other thing, and then I finally got off the bra and everything fell, and you know, um, and then I ended up with teeth and contact lenses, you know, a lot of that went on, and then wigs and false bits and everything, and then the, um, the uh, Michael then came on stage, where I'd left everything on the chair, I went off and said, good night, darling, and kissed the chair, you see. And brought the house down, really. Yeah. really. No, really. Yeah. And, and then we lost track of it. <laughs> and we went off I find that emotionally quite disturbing. <laughs> You're rejoicing again, aren't you? How many times is that now? Uh, five, if you count the tryout at Farnham, yes. Wow. Um, twice in the West End, and then we took it to America, to a place called the Long Wharf Theatre in Connecticut, which was amazing because of course they never heard of me and they never heard of uh, Joyce really and of course some of the sketches I you know obviously I I don't do an impersonation of her because that wouldn't be right although sort of first memories are of the Centrinian's films you know yeah. and and um, that marvelous sort of Miss Gossage you know and mm. all that sort of you know I say ten days leave for wedding Kamana says you only get spliced once you might as well enjoy it <laughs> Um, oh, oh, you're postponing our wedding? Well, that's, what am I going to tell the girls? They bought us a toast rack and everything, you know. <laughs> um, it's just wonderful observation all the time, and, uh, and, and it, it sort of makes me very happy, which is why, in case you're going to ask, I'm sure you're not, because I'm not going to stop talking for long enough to let you. <laughs> <laughs> which is why I'm doing it again. Thank you. <laughs> let me ask about you, the aforementioned uh, Beatty. Is Beatty gone forever? Be I've hung up my um, mobile phone forever, yes, I'm afraid. <laughs> Anyone here who'd like to audition to take over from me? Come on. How did she get the final pips? Uh, 
Well, they haven't really seen her off in that sense. We just made five final commercials, and um, tomorrow we're having a little drink. <laughs> Um, uh, I don't know, I, I had this idea, which they didn't buy, which was that you, you shoot a commercial quite normally, and you show the commercial quite normally, and then suddenly, through the psych, psych at the back, bursts Maureen Lippmann in ordinary gear, without the padding and the wig, looking possibly three or four years younger, and bursts through this thing and kills Beatty. <laughs> Push him over the face, and she's still talking. <laughs> She finally dies, and the next shot is Maureen sitting by the phone in her flat, longing for her agent to ring because she's got no work. <laughs> Which I thought would have been quite cute, but anyway, they didn't, they, they buy, didn't it, buy it. They didn't buy that one. I suppose Very in exciting. the end, with the new logo and all that's going on, and you know the different companies coming in, I mean, I think it's it's a good thing. I shall be sorry because she's funny and she's been very good to me but it's a, everything's got to change it's like a soap you know you you if you stay in it then you're making some kind of deal with the devil and you have to uh, answer for that you know it'll take me i should think 15 years to stop perfect strangers in the street asking me how my son melvin is <laughs> and saying have you got an allergy <clears throat> and this you know then you'll be beat his age by the time there's Still asking you. I'll be begging to go back then. Won't I be very poor? <laughs> Michael, I don't, I don't remember seeing you in an ad. Well, you wouldn't have seen the, about the only ad I ever did, which was for Hunky Chunks dog food. <laughs> uh, it disappeared. Do you remember it? No. I no, you don't. It. it was tested in the Southampton area, I think, and all the dogs died. So uh, <laughs> I did it actually with Cleese a long time ago. You appeared then? <laughs> I appeared, yes, I appeared with a tin of Hunky Chunks dog food in, I remember where I shot it. We shot it for some reason outside the Mary Stopes family planning clinic. <laughs> and they were all inside, so I was the only one out in the street, you know, and, and somebody crossed the road, the window cued me, and I would say this, you know, big, beefy, chunky, lovely, lots of lovely gravy, all that sort of stuff, and people would go by and, you know, obviously <laughs> thought there was some problem. <laughs> So I, that was the last I did, and since then I've, I've not done any. I mean, actually, I, I, um, I, I've never found anything that I really wanted to advertise. I mean, there's nothing I felt so strongly about that I wanted to use my name to persuade others to buy it. I mean, all the enterprises that I would like to support by giving my name to are all other, they can't afford advertising on television. It's like, you know, a good sort of real ale brewery or the... Toilet man who does our, our newspaper shop at the end of the street. I'd love to go and advertise him, but you know, he wouldn't get much time on television. He needs a new bicycle. Um, <laughs> when, if you were to be tempted to do a commercial, what would it be? Well, we have been, well, I have been asked to do a Coca Cola one, which happened, I know. You got it! <laughs> uh, which I turned down because. I suppose if I was seriously going, seriously going to contemplate endorsing something, it would have to be some kind of environmentally friendly product or at least something that was going to help the future of the planet instead of just make a few quick bucks. My news agent. <laughs> just <laughs> very good. All gets recycled. Well, went, uh, slightly cross-eyed at that moment. You, um... Well, I've never thought about it from that point of view. I mean, I'm full of admiration. I never thought about it. I mean, it never occurred to me to, just, to say, you know, is BT something I would like to... And that's probably why I get all the stick from people complaining about the bills all the time, you know. <laughs> I mean, somebody actually came up to me at the bank machine and said, I'd like to kick you right up the backside. <laughs> you were an Thank actress you. doing a job. That yes, that. and yeah. I, I, it has occurred to me that I, I wouldn't take a play because, um, because I felt I agreed ideo ideologically with the subject matter. I mean, I could never play Lady M or anything. But could it I? is slightly different because you are an actress, so you can take on a role and that role can promote it. Mm. Whereas if it was Wendy James doing it... Yes, she I mean, wouldn't... Michael Jackson's done it and all those pop stars have I know, done it. And I, I find that really horrific because he is already so incredibly unnecessarily wealthy and he's making so many millions mm. out of, quite frankly, a drink that is full of chemicals and doesn't do you any good. So I really don't see where... <laughs> that was an ad for Pepsi. <laughs> but... Your mum has appeared in your ads, hasn't she? Uh, oh, yes, she, she, uh, yes, we went to um, Paris together. Some people take their lovers. <laughs> um, <laughs> take my mother. Um, we went to Paris and, um, and she was in a scene. She's actually sitting behind me in the cafe scene with Harry and me and the, the French people. And we did 22 takes. Yeah. 
And, you know, it's kind of, Zelma, you're looking in the camera again. Was I? <laughs> oh, sorry. You see, and we did it. We finally did it. And, of course, there's this little person. And afterwards, when it was shown, she rang me and said, I saw that commercial. If your Ari had just leant forward a bit more, you'd have had a lovely view of me. <laughs> <laughs> Is she as much fun as she sounds? No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, she's great fun. She's a great sort of... Mist she's Gracie Allen Holstar, the mistress of the non sequitur, you know, the, um... Ooh, doesn't it soon get to ten to ten? <laughs> <laughs> There's a lovely, lovely moment round about... Just over Christmas, I was having a New Year's Eve party and I was busy doing things and sorting things out. Now, I, I found this quote in one of my... I write things down and I didn't keep a diary, but I write things that people have said and observations in my diary and I found this extraordinary piece of literature really which Jack had um, told me about when he was working on Yentl, the Barbara Streisand film and it was a text from an old prophet you know from teachings of Maimonides and it's about how many times this will fit in well with the program actually how many times you should make love to your wife depending on your job and I found this quite fascinating, you know, TV <laughs> presenter. No, it said, um, it said, ask driver three times a week, um, plumber. No, it wouldn't have said plumber, would it? It's going to be ridiculous, Maureen. <laughs> 12th century. Well, it, might. it said, um, you know, camel driver twice a week. So I'm reading this out. I said, listen to this. If you're an ask driver, you have to make love to your wife three times a week. If you're a teacher, you have to make love to your wife once a week. If you're a student, you have to make love to your wife once a month. And my mother said, oh, that reminds me. Are you having fruit salad at this party? <laughs> uh, and for some reason, I, I think that's the point at which I shall say thank you very much indeed. Maureen Lipman. Thank you. And Wendy Jane. Michael Palin. And thanks for your company. See you next week. Good night. And next Saturday, Michael is joined by Clive James, Boy George and Sharon Gliss. And remember, you can see more from Michael Palin next Wednesday when we celebrate 21 years of Monty Python comedy in our ABC special, Life of Python, next Wednesday night at 8.30. Stay with us now for our Saturday movie, Underwater.